Hello, and thanks for tuning in to episode four of the Boudoir Guild's book club. I am once again joined by Nathan Ulritz of the Boca Podcast. This is the second half of our previous episode, therefore part four, and I'm going to dive into one of my faves that I read a few years ago that's made a huge difference in both my life and business. All right, so my... My book for this episode is The 4-Hour Work Week from Tim Ferriss. Have yes, you read that? Absolutely. And the summation is that he's engineered his business so that he really only has to put 4 hours a week into making sure it's still running. He's created this machine. I think it was Amazon drop shipping was the business that he talked about in that book and he had his products up, somebody managing those, somebody managing distribution. Everything was all automated with, you know, Zapier, email, automation, everything. So he just had to check in every week and make sure the system continued running. And that allowed him to go anywhere, do whatever he wanted, structure his life in any way, because work didn't take over his schedule. It financed his lifestyle rather than mm. becoming his lifestyle. And... I absolutely loved that message. And it's difficult for us as photographers because we need to be behind the camera photographing our clients. And there's a lot of things that we actually have to be present for. But I also believe there is a tremendous amount of work that we do that we really should not be the ones doing. And this will allow us to free up so much more time in our schedule to do literally anything else. It could be take more clients to make more money. It could be to go on vacations or, you know, join a book club, anything. <laughs> <laughs> when, when did you read this book? How recently? Probably four years ago. Okay, cool. And I'd gone down to San Diego for a business networking event mm. and driving to San Diego for me could take six and a half hours. I've had it take 12. It's oh, just, wow. Silicon Valley, like one car accident on the only southbound highway out of here mm. could be a two and a half hour adventure. could be an hour adventure. Mm. Same thing going through Los Angeles. It's a coin flip. Um, but I always listen to audiobooks, and that's a great opportunity for me to usually get through two books in that week while I'm on, I'm on the road. And that was one of those adventures driving, driving back home. And it's a, it's a short book and I've since read a lot of his other ones and he's got some lengthy lengthy tomes he does yeah yeah uh, but i i just i loved the things in the four hour work week that i had never even considered before because mm. at the time i didn't think that i needed to have an assistant like an admin to help me out but then there's the saying if you don't have an administrative assistant you are one and <laughs> that's true and I, i'm not knocking administrative assistants but my time is not best spent doing those sorts of tasks. Mm -hmm. That's not my zone of genius. It's not how I actually get paid. So hiring someone to come in and take over those responsibilities frees me up to, again, photograph more clients, to take days off, to do whatever else I want. Um, and, you know, as, as photographers, we think I have to edit my own work because no one can quite do the style like I do. And nobody can do consults and and connect with clients the way that I do. And no one can write my social media posts and really, really speak like I do. And it's all a lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, it, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Those are, it's one of those titles for our work week that I think people would hear and, and have certainly heard or seen and they write off the title uh, or they write off the idea of even reading the book because they're like four hours, there's no way, like that's not even possible. And Tim has actually come out since putting the book out because he originally put this book out something like 15 years ago, maybe a little bit longer. Yeah. Uh, and he's since come out and said, look, I, it wasn't like I didn't I wasn't trying to suggest that you only work four hours a week. He managed to get his workflow down, like you explained, Mike, to a place where he was able to get his actual time put into the business down to four hours. But what he was actually the, the focus of the books actually is and the premise actually is, is how to work intelligently so that you can minimize the time spent on, we'll call it just for the sake of conversation, busy work. Yep. How you can minimize the time spent on busy work so that you can then choose how to spend your time. Otherwise, it doesn't mean that we then go sit and watch Netflix for 40 hours a week necessarily. Maybe it, maybe that's part of it. But what it does mean is flexibility choice at the end of the day as to how we're spending 
our time. And so the principles in that book, some of them technologically are a bit dated, but the principles that drive that book are extremely valuable for anybody listening in any type of business. You can, you can go read that book, learn and apply the principles, and it will give you a lot more freedom and flexibility. Maybe you only want to work four hours a week, or maybe you want to work 20 hours a week, but they're, the, the principles are applicable nonetheless. Absolutely. And maybe you want to work 60, but if you could generate all your revenue in 30, and that'll give you 30 hours to, I don't know, volunteer at a nonprofit, start a nonprofit, like do anything else. Like you said, it's the choice and the flexibility. And that's, that's it. That's it. So what was the, what was it like the first time you outsourced something that you thought only you could do or have you experienced that? Yeah. Well, and, and it's, it's highly ironic, right? Because I own an, a post-production company in photographers edit and it's all about delegating in this case, editing work to yeah. our team to get done that where I had a big learning curve was when it came to continuing to build our team at photographers edit and associated brands. Um, and then not just building the team, but wanting to be a better manager communication, um, learning how to communicate what it was that I wanted done effectively in a way that actually is understand that's clear to that person based on the way that they communicate, um, in a way that is structured enough that they can then go do that thing. They don't have to guess about this or guess about that. The communication piece of, of delegation um, has been, honestly, it's an ongoing learning curve because you have different personality types, so-called personality types and styles of communication. Um, and in some cases, potential language barriers. So like, how do, you, how do you work within all of those things to effectively communicate what it is that you want done in a way that's clear enough uh, to follow? That's been the biggest challenge for me. Have you experienced some of that? Yes. Um... My in-house editor, in-house, lives in the Philippines. Okay. So we have time zones to coordinate also. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the language barrier. It, And as we kind of talked about earlier, when you were practicing your conversations, how do you say things more concisely? Mm -hmm. That's the thing that I've really worked on when it comes to outsourcing. Because <sighs> abdication is also not a strategy. So I can't just give somebody a thing and expect them to figure it out on their own and have yeah. it magically turn out the way that I want it. That's yeah. setting us both up for failure. Yeah. So learning how to explain things as succinctly as possible, that that was a huge challenge. Something that I sure. say a lot of times is, uh, is, and I encourage our team as we're thinking about how we manage expectations of our clients. This isn't even about delegating necessarily. It's just communication in general. Manage, and, and it's actually highly relevant to, this, to, to photographers listening and thinking about how they're communicating with their clients. If you're thinking about how you manage the expectations of your clients or potential clients when it comes to your processes, how they interact with your company, how a photo shoot works, et cetera. We have to be able to, you talked about distilling down and the way I like to frame it is let's distill it down to the extent that I can communicate this idea or this process to a third grader or a fifth yeah. grader. And it's not about lack of intelligence. It, there are so many other variables in, in play here that, that in many cases we wouldn't even think about. We're so used to thinking about it internally and we just kind of assume that if we just kind of you know, throw up some version of what's in our head, they're gonna be able to figure it out. And I've been guilty yeah. of that a million times over. And it's certainly at the, the other end of poor experiences of photographers trying to outsource their editing to our company, they just kind of expect us to read their minds. And it sounds kind of funny and even cynical, but that's just what we have a tendency of doing if we're not used to managing or working with other people. Right. So if we can distill that workflow down, whatever the thing is, outsourcing editing, you know, email management, album design, uh, et cetera, the list goes on. Vacuuming our house if we're you know, outsourcing our... our um, the cleaning. Yeah. If we can distill it down to a level where we're literally using the vocabulary of a third grader or maybe a fifth grader, that's a good goal. Um, and then maybe once we've done that, once we've distilled it down to that level of vocabulary, then how many of these, what percentage of these words can we actually take out of the process as well? So there's even less confusion because we all know that our eyes start to glaze over after like five seconds because we live in this scrolling world, right? So if we're sending paragraphs of information or a long email or run a phone for 20 minutes trying to explain something, the reality is we probably don't understand it well enough for ourselves to then be able to distill it down and communicate it in a way it's a lot simpler, a lot easier to understand. So yeah. that seems to, 
that seems to be extremely beneficial. If we can work on it from that perspective, um, we're stepping in the right direction. Yeah, totally. I've also really learned a lot about myself and the business by bringing other people on board and explaining the processes. Mm. Cause there are times where I'm explaining how I do something and realizing like, wow, that's not as efficient as I thought it was. Or, <laughs> yeah. You know, why are we even doing this? Yeah. I haven't taken that kind of inventory in a while. And, and that's been great. Mm -hmm. uh, and then having check-ins with people as well. I, I love how you said making sure you're communicating in their communication style rather than force our own on people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for example, we find our email open rates for our consult reminders and appointment reminders are really low. Maybe it's time to explore SMS messaging because everyone gets text messages. So rather than get frustrated because people aren't receiving our message, yep. we need to change how we deliver that or maybe change the message, maybe both. Uh, and and, and being willing somebody... to take that objective feedback from outside too. Like we, we hired um, Jill who runs our digital marketing, also happens to be my girlfriend. She, she was in education all of her professional career. Mm -hmm. So when she joined our company a couple of years ago, her perspective was invaluable because here was somebody that wasn't in the photography industry, didn't speak the language, certainly hadn't been part of my editing company, um, hadn't produced a podcast before. There were a lot of things she hadn't done before. So the, the perspective that she brought to bear as a result of that kind of being on the outside, incredibly valuable, still valuable. Yeah. Um, so if we're willing to, you know, set our egos aside and take a, outside feedback from, it could be friends, family, et cetera, who aren't part of what it is that we do in day, day in and day out with our blinders on, um, there might be a really incredible opportunity to not only refine our processes, but refine the communication so that we're, we're communicating, whether it's through our website or emails or texts or otherwise, in a way that's easy to understand more objectively. The systematization of things, that, that was a big thing for me too. Even if I'm not outsourcing it to somebody else, just figuring out how do I automate as many things as I can without taking the human element out of mm. what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the cool things about the AI writing software like chat yeah. GPT. I can write emails now. Well, it can write them for me with my prompts, <laughs> Yeah, which is another great, great way to practice explaining something very briefly. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like me or I take the rough draft and I make it sound like me anyway. And then I can put that into my, my CRM or wherever it will be sent from and automate everything. So now when people opt into my Facebook ads, like they fill out a lead form, they get a text message four minutes later saying, Hey, thanks so much for reaching out. Or I just saw that you, you inquired about doing a boudoir session. If you haven't already booked your consult, you can click this link to do it. Cool. And it, it doesn't sound like sterile corporate speak. Right. It sounds like me because that's a text that I was writing to people. And I mm. have a Word document always open on my computer. All of my responses that I send out for different scenarios, whether it's email, text, or a direct message. Cool. Because it's a different language on all those things. Links are sent differently in all of those things. And I don't want to have to manually type that out. So I can at least get... 98% of it mm -hmm. with a copy paste and then go from there. Or again, if somebody messages me, they can have an auto responder that can, that can handle most inquiries without it sounding like Comcast customer service <laughs> where they say our automated phone system can handle most customer inquiries, you know, click to see the menu, whatever. I'm like, I don't know. Person, agent, human, <laughs> I just keep hitting zero. <laughs> zero, right? <laughs> yeah. So we can absolutely automate so many things in our workflow without sounding like Comcast. <laughs> and true. right? And and same with hiring an editor or outsourcing an editing company. There is that communication in the beginning to dial the process in. There's always gonna be more work up front than if you just do the thing on your own. But you get over that initial hurdle. And then you have so much more free time and flexibility. I, I, and I love that hybrid approach that you've taken of you personalize the tone of that text for copy or, te or actual SMS or whatever the case. But then you also are leveraging automation just by being able to copy paste. I think it's a, it's a good combination of both. Have you found too using ChatGPT um, now with version four, have you found that it, that it is able to kind of customize tone to match yours even better? Or what's that been like? I haven't even tried 
honestly. Okay. Um, I use it more as a rough draft, rough draft generator anyway. Okay. Because I am trying to future proof my content against duplicate content issues. Mm. I I don't know enough about the AI software to know how often the same responses are being given. If this, you know, interesting multiple people using the exact same prompt. Yeah. Given we're all describing things differently, but if you say, you know, write me ten blog post ideas for boudoir photography. I'm sure more than one person is asking it that. Right. I don't want to have the same headlines somebody else's, given I get everything from doing keyword research through Google. So that's where I'm getting most of my prompts anyway, but I... So are, I you, are you using it as, uh, you talked about using it as a, a rough draft writer. So it gives you the structure and then you're adding the personal element around that structure? It's writing out most of my stuff, okay. like, um, you know, staying with the blog posts, for example, uh, should you get a, a spray tan before your photo shoot? Okay. This is a very controversial topic. 99.9% okay. uh, .9 of photographers say no, right? Uh, I actually have someone in my area who is phenomenal at giving spray tans. People don't look orange. It doesn't streak or splotch as long as they follow the aftercare directions. Yeah. And so like, that's what I wanted to write, but I would, you know, ask it that question based on what it gives me. Can I take some parts of it and, and change it? But also it gave me new ideas I hadn't considered before. Like what should you bring or what should you not bring to a boudoir session? Hmm. And the list that it gave me was like negative energy and, <laughs> uh, your insecurities and things like that. And, the intangibles and it blew my mind. Like mm. that's way better than the list I came up with. Mm. So I made two, I made two blog posts out of that instead. It was like, here's the tangibles and the intangibles basically. Cool. And then just reworded each of the things so that it was absolutely unique. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah I hadn't, hadn't thought about that simple reality of, of multiple photographers using the platform the same way and then getting the same text generated. That's kind of funny to think about. We tested that in the, our Facebook group chat. Yeah. Um, I think three of us in different parts of the country. Okay. Uh, what Jason's in Nashville, Mark is in uh, Carolinas, and then I'm out in California. We just copy pasted the same sentence in and we all got very different responses, but wow, three is not an adequate sample size for any <laughs> test. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Uh, it was promising, but I, I don't want to risk it because I know Google is also trying to figure out how to identify AI generated content to punish people in search results because they want actual humans curating the content. But this almost takes us away from being content creators and turns us into content curators, mm. which uh, is still extremely valuable. It's, you know, anytime we put together a Pinterest board, we're curating content versus creating. Um, I mean, ESPN's entire business model is curating content about sports. They don't do any sports. They just talk about sports yep. or a museum, you know? So I, I think there's plenty of opportunity for that as far as using AI goes too. Well, the way that I heard Gary Vaynerchuk talk about it, was that we are essentially idea generators. So we can leverage these tools. If we come with the ideas, we plug the ideas in, and then we're able to leverage tools like ChatGPT to enable us then to go implement those ideas. But um, this, where you would say that the, you know, the, the men are separated from the boys or the women from the girls, it's, it, it, it now kind of manifests itself in that regard, in that context with idea generation, which for me anyway, was very compelling because I'm not naturally a super creative person. Mm -hmm. I'm good at getting things done, um, learning s structure and then going implementing, um, the structure of that particular, you know, workflow, for example. But when it comes to the actual creativity coming up with the idea to begin with, um, I don't feel like I'm as strong in that regard. So that's been compelling to me because I'm like, oh shoot, I need to get better at idea generation for multiple reasons, including the ability to be able to leverage these tools more effectively. Yeah. And I'm on the other end of that spectrum. Okay. I would rather, I'm like the, the visionary. I do not want to get in and do the nuts and bolts stuff. That takes <laughs> okay. a tremendous amount of energy for me. Yeah. So that's how I've leveraged these AI programs mm. is 
I can create this content now based on my own ideas so much faster and using less cognitive load. Mm. And that frees up, you know, just my brain power for the day to then go focus on these other tasks. Cool. That totally so, makes sense. And that's another, another thing from the four hour work week is, you know, how are you spending your energy? It's not just about yeah. the minutes on the clock, but where is your energy being used and does it really serve you in the best of your, uh, to the best effect and, and taking that inventory of your, of your days, it can really help you clean that up. Yeah, there was, I mean, of all people, do, do you know who Logan Paul is? The, he's like big in the crypto space, card collector, right? Yeah, there are a number of different things. He's, okay. I mean, he was originally known as a YouTuber and a kind of a crazy one at that, uh, or a wild one at that. He's actually in the pro wrestling space now as a podcast, a variety of things. The reason I say it's kind of funny coming from him is both because of his at least past reputation and also just because he's super young, but he, I, I think it was actually in one of his podcast episodes, um, he, I, and I wrote down the quote because it, it really grabbed my attention. He said, your energy is your currency. And I hadn't really thought about that uh, or prioritized that kind of thought process in the past. I think maybe in part because I just thought, I have endless energy to give. Like I can, I'll, I'll do the work. Um, I'm, you know, I'm excited about this thing, so I'm willing to put the work into the time in to whatever it is, my business, relationships, or otherwise. But I've hit a stage in my life. I, some might say because of my age, I'm not sure if that's actually the case, but I've hit a stage in my life where it, if for no other reason than I'm juggling a lot of different things, I really realistically have to consider the amount of energy that I have to give to each of those things again, personally and professionally. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I love that you bring that up because that I know for me in, in particular as of late, that's been something that's been kind of front of mind. Yep. And you mentioned, you know, even outsourcing vacuuming your home earlier. Yeah. This is another one of those great examples where things we do in business are things we do in life. There is no separation between the mm. two and you don't have to be bougie to have a house cleaner. It doesn't make you a, any type of person other than maybe a more efficient one. Like you're not a terrible homemaker because you don't clean your own home. Mm. Uh, you're freeing up that time to do anything else you know like i could have my house being cleaned right now while we're recording this and we wouldn't get to do this content if i had to do these other tasks because the house needs to get cleaned laundry needs to get done you know having groceries delivered or or any number of things that we can we can outsource and automate and they're just freeing up little bites of, of time and energy that are both very finite yeah and i that's so powerful, actually. Again, I'm so glad you bring this up because um, we, I think ultimately this whole idea of, of being able to structure our lives to, to function more efficiently, again, personally and professionally, certainly to consider the idea of delegation in, in both of those uh, realms. We, it's, it really is most effective when we're clear about what it is that we're trying to achieve. I mean, it goes back to, it's very similar in, actually to that conversation around delegation. If I know what I actually want, then I can filter how I spend my time and what I do more effectively. If I don't know what I'm trying to achieve with my life personally, first of all, and then professionally, then it's a lot more difficult to decide where to put my time and what needs to be delegated and what doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I think back to my kids are basically grown now. My daughter's about to graduate from high school. My son's in college. Uh, but when they were super young, my partner at the time and I kind of debated whether or not to outsource or delegate our house cleaning to somebody because in part we want also wanted to teach our kids discipline and, and structure putting a little bit of time and effort into you know being part of the household but at the same time what was ultimately more important to us and this is where understanding priorities came into play what was more important to us is that we had time with the kids yeah. so we're, we're running a business it could keep us quite busy if we had the ability to pay somebody to come in and clean the house, yes, it takes away the opportunity for them to learn a little bit about discipline um, and taking some responsibility. But what it did enable was a bigger priority to us. And we had kind of established that at that point, uh, which was to be able to spend time with our kids. And so we were able to make that decision because we understood what our priorities were. And I would just encourage everybody listening and watching 
be clear. I call it a big picture view, our overarching set of values. I alluded to those earlier and goals, what it is that I want to achieve personally, what it is that I want to achieve as a result professionally. If yeah. you establish that big picture view, you can make these decisions about what you delegate, what you don't, how you spend your time, how you spend your money a lot more effectively at that point. Yep. And those things are going to change over time. Absolutely. And so it's important to make sure you schedule time for reflection yeah. and reevaluation, you know, whether it's monthly check-ins, quarterly, annual. And it, it, this isn't about business meetings. This is about your life. I think, you know, it's again, they're the exact same same systems. So true. So powerful. <laughs> so Nathan, thank you again for joining me for part four of the Boudoir Guilds book club. Again, this is just another great opportunity for us to have killer conversations and then share it with everyone watching the channel. Maybe I'm being selfish and this is an excuse for us to just sit down and talk about books. I don't know, but I'm stoked that we get this opportunity and that we get to share it with everybody else as well. Yeah, truly my privilege. And I would just encourage everybody listening and watching to go not only grab these books, but then go apply them. Super powerful principles in both. Yeah. And jump into the Boudoir Guild's Facebook group and let us know how you're applying these, uh, the different lessons you're learning from these books. And, and the links will be posted below from the Boudoir Guild's book club website. So you can go check that out as well and pick up a copy for yourselves. Well, cheers. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Mike.